Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 33. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, welcome to yet another adventure where we explore the diverse and exciting world of careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. In this new episode, we have the pleasure of speaking to Giacomo Valle, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago and co-founder of My Leg. Uh, Giacomo's research focuses on developing neuroprosthetics and sensory feedback methods to restore movement and sensation in individuals with paralysis. He received his education and training in neuroengineering from institutions across Europe, and he has since worked at several leading research labs in Switzerland and the United States. Join us as we discuss his career journey, current research projects, and advice for aspiring neuroengineers. Welcome, Giacomo. It's a pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Thank you for joining us. Can you give us a brief introduction and let our listeners know where are you joining us from? And maybe you can share some interesting fact or information about the institution that you are working for. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for the, for the invitation and for such amazing introduction. I'm currently at the University of Chicago in the Besmaya lab. So I joined the lab quite recently, so in the in October 2022. I moved from, from Zurich. I was at ETH Zurich. I'm still in the field of neuroengineering. I moved from peripheral nerve stimulation and bionic hands for people with amputation to intracortical microstimulation and sensory feedback again, but stimulating the brain this time. So again, bionic hands, but for people with paralysis, such as, for example, after spinal cord injury, or in general, exactly a lesion of the communication between the brain and the body. This lab is particularly uh, famous for their research in touch in general. So just to give you a background, this is the field of brain-computer interface. So what we're trying to do is connect humans and machines, so the brain and robots in general. And in this field of bidirectional neuroprosthesis, what we're trying to do is record information from the brain to control extracorporeal limbs or prosthetic hands. And then we use sensors to send back sensor information to the brain, creating a kind of closed-loop device. And in this lab, we are focused really on the sensory stuff, so on the sensory restoration, and I'm particularly interested in this part of the projects. So we have the unique opportunity to work with patients implanted with the technology chronically. So there is Scott, our subject in here, a beautiful person that is giving us time and effort and together to develop this type of devices. That sounds absolutely fascinating. And as you started talking about Scott, whom you are trying to help and who is helping you, yes, to develop, maybe you can share his story and what type of research you are doing with him. I think that would be a beautiful introduction for our listeners. Yes, sure, sure, sure. Since I started to work in the field of neuroprosthetics and like translation on neuroengineering, uh, I found immediately many patients and pioneers uh, that are uh, really involved uh, in the, the, the most important elements and participants for this type of research and the development of new devices and help also a larger cohort of population and patients suffering by paralysis or uh, other type of neurological disease. So already when I work in the field of prosthetics, I had the opportunity to work with 
really pioneers because they are people that maybe cannot use the technology in their daily life and have an improvement, immediate improvement in their life, but they are like persons that are like helping us to develop the technology to arrive at a certain point and then we can then commercialize and have in hospitals uh, and at home of other patients. So maybe in the future, in the next like five or 10 years. So, but they are like working with us multiple days per week and uh, really participating in the what we call the user center development. So the, it's the, really the person that needs the device and the technology that is actively working with us and helping to develop new effective technology. So in this case in here, Scott has a spinal cord injury. He had the accident driving his own car when he was very young. And now he recover some function during like uh, during the years. Uh, he's able to move. So of course he has a certain level of impairments, but he's really positive person, really motivated to help people and also to uh, have a normal life. Um, so he decided to join this program where the idea is to develop intracortical brain computer interfaces that can be useful for people with uh, tetraplegia, for example, or uh, paralysis, and try to communicate with extracorporeal devices. Uh, The project has two main goals. Uh, So one is technological and the other one is more scientific. Uh, So for one side, of course, uh, develop some device that can bidirectionally communicate with the brain, exchange reading information and writing information to the brain. And the other part is to study the basics of motor control and sensory encoding in the human brain. Because with this technology, you have also the unique opportunity as researchers and scientists to study the brain with a specific and unique position. No? You have like a, an implanted electrodes with multiple channels in a human brain doing and interacting with the environment. Yeah, thank you so much. And I need to say that I'm so excited talking to you today because I'm receiving so many questions from students who are interested in neural engineering. So you are our so valuable podcast guest today. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you. And for those who are curious about this field, Can you briefly just introduce the field of neuroengineering? And you also mentioned that you are specifically specializing in translational neuroengineering. So can you also define that field and what is that special subfield of neuroengineering where you are doing this translational type of work? Sure, yes. So the neuroengineering is that type of research and field of engineering where The scope is to develop a technology, in particular neurotechnology, that can interact with the brain with the scope of restoring functions that are, for example, affected after a certain injury or a neurological disease, and study also the brain, the spinal cord nerves, and everything that is related with the nervous system. So it's a it's a science that's trying to connect in general technology and the nervous system, the human nervous system, but also uh, study not only in humans, of course, but also in animals. So it's the bridge between uh, like technology and the brain. In particular, the branch of translational neuroengineering yeah, is that part where this technology is also is developed not only for basic science, like to study the, the basic processing of the sensory system or the, the neural system, but in general to help people in daily life, uh, patients uh, that need support for rehabilitation or, or assistance. Uh, so the technology that can help the patients also outside of the lab also at at their home, for example, or in daily life. So it's something that is going more towards the really the the patient's need to solve the problems related to their neurological disorders. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. And how did you become interested in this field? And is this something along the lines whom you wanted to be when you were growing up or it's something completely different? <laughs> yeah. So thank you for the question. Yes. So in particular, I was uh, always since uh, when I was a kid, really interested in the science fiction is everything related to, you know, connection of robotics and the brain and everything related to that and medicine of course so all these like uh, ingredients put it together like are the neuroengineer so of course this is like something related to engineering but this type of studies are in general interdisciplinary and that create a kind of collaboration of multiple like background and um, yeah because for example if you think about brain computer interface in the moment that you put together these two, like uh, medicine and engineering, you need for the part of robotics, uh, people that are experts of software, hardware, uh, mechanical part of the robots, um, software to put in communication and to create interface between the, like, the biological system and the uh, robotic system, then the neurosurgeon, and the neuro and the, the neurologists for like implanting maybe the technology and help the patient uh, during and after the implants, the rehabilitation phase with all the rehabilitation specialists, physiotherapists, and when you create this communication, also the effect at the cognitive level with the psychologist. You know, it's a very broad and uh, wide spectrum of people and the expertise and background. The neuroengineer is a kind of person that can stay in between of all these exactly background, creating this connection between technology and medicine. So this is why I decided to, to study this specific field. Yeah, that's beautiful. And indeed, this field is very multidisciplinary field. It's beautiful how you describe in sci-fi movies, it's like that middle earth. (laughs) So that connects all other worlds. So yeah, that's beautiful. Can you tell our listeners about the neuroengineering program that you completed at the University of Genoa? And what was covered in the curriculum? What do you feel prepared you for the work that you are doing right now? First of all, since I want to like highlight the fact that since it's so multidisciplinary, in general, students that are also doing psychology or medicine or like something that is not properly engineering can work and can be a valuable support and help with a different background in the team that is like tackling a so important and so like a complex problem, like, uh, for example, brain computer interfacing. So this is, first of all, important to say, because, uh, for example, there are students that are like contacting me asking, OK, but unfortunately I did like another thing and now I'm interested in this. This can be like a valuable can be like uh, something different that you can bring to the team with your background that I think is very valuable. I study neuroengineering in Genoa, where there is a specific program connected with the IIT, that is the Italian Institute of Technology. It is one of the most important centers in Italy for bioengineering and in particular neuroengineering. So there is like a, an applied part where you can go to the laboratories, uh, participate in some study, start to have like an interaction with uh, technology and this is quite unique. Then I moved to Switzerland that is specifically I think one of the best places in Europe uh, for this type of research. Uh, Both EPFL in Lausanne and ETH in Zurich uh, are proposing programs where they really combine uh, theoretical parts uh, on neuroscience um, and also practical implementation with uh, with robots and with uh, rehabilitations. It's also a nice multicultural environment that is very valuable and with a really nice ecosystem of industries also around. So even if maybe someone can be interested in the field but not in the research, so there is also the option to have like companies or startups that are trying to bring this technology to the market or to the to the next step. Even if I have to say finally that U.S. is probably the best place for neurotech. So neurotech is a U.S. thing. But still, in Europe, we are trying to do our best yeah, for that. 
Yeah, and maybe you can mention some other programs in the world and in the United States that are known for their programs in neuroengineering. Just to give that broad perspective because of your multinational background working in this field. Yeah, sure. In general, the first advice that I can give is it is not necessary that the best programs in a specific field, as in this case, neuroengineering, are related to the most famous universities. Okay, so it's not that okay if I don't go to Harvard or to like uh, Cambridge or something, I cannot find the best program for for a specific topic. So this is very important to maybe the students that are like approaching the field are like um, skeptical on this, but it's like that. So there are like maybe small universities, less famous, or where there are like a specific program in brain-computer interface, neuroengineering, bioengineering, tissue engineering that are super famous because of the like a group of professors that are really leading the, the field or they have a specific technology that they invented it there. And so it's it's a very unique method that, that you can learn even in a smaller university. So for specifically for neuroengineering, um, so as I said, in US there are many more universities or like um, consortia of labs. Uh, for example, here in Chicago, there is a nice collaboration and a research group that's called Cortical Bionics, where the University of Chicago, Northwestern University, and the hospital together with also University of Pittsburgh are collaborating together, sharing information, code, the patients, uh, creating a kind of strong network uh, for developing technology because we need to remember that these type of projects are normally quite expensive, so needs a, like like big funding support. So if more labs are together, can really create a technology that can be effective. University of Pittsburgh has also a strong program on neuroengineering where they are working both on peripheral nerve stimulation, brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation. Then there is John Hopkins University, also very famous for brain-computer interface, the group in, in Stanford and, and Caltech, also California. Michigan as well. So there are many, many, many groups. Uh, for Europe, of course, as I always suggest uh, for my personal experience, Switzerland, but also uh, Germany. There are like in Freiburg, um, there is a center where more focalized on the development of electrodes. So more on manufacturing, you see something more specific, like small implantable electrodes, but they are really good. And all the groups that are now approaching this field are contacting them for using their technology. So this is a valuable thing. And I think in general, if we look not only the labs, but also the opportunity in, um, in companies, US is growing very fast in this direction. So we, we know all Neuralink, Synchron, and yeah, but I think in the next uh, five, 10 years, um, many more groups will approach this field. It's just so beautiful to see how the field is exploding. Yeah. So what do you think are the most important skills or areas of expertise for individuals pursuing a career in neuroengineering? And how can they develop those skills? This is not a, like a super straightforward answer because I think it's really connected with what you really are passionate for. As I said, since when you approach some complex problem like brain-computer interfacing or neuroprosthetic development, uh, there are so many different aspects that you can work on, like starting from hardware, software, interface, uh, data analysis, or uh, robotics. So there are so many things where we can improve or we can study the effect of this technology that you have space to like decide to be the responsible person for the decoding, the algorithms, or for the development of the robot. You just need to understand what is the more like interesting part and topic for you. And in general, of course, you need the basic of everything, like a basic of programming, basic of electrical engineering and data analysis. Of course, this is something that is in general useful when you approach research. 
and apply research like engineering. But then I think that if you start to do like project from the like master and from the like a semester project, everything related to the, the university, specific on some tool that you want to learn to, to like how to use these tools, then you can apply this and use this background to any type of problem. You just need dedication, passion for that. If I think you can do it. I mean, this is what I think. Thank you. And what are the unique challenges just specific to the field of neuroengineering in terms of studying and working in this field? Yeah. So there are uh, many, many research questions now that are discussed and approached now that the technology is improving now, many more goals and ideas are coming. But in general, for my specific area, so brain-computer interfaces that try to create this bidirectional communication with extracorporeal link with prosthetic device, there are now three main questions, I think. One is how to decode information from the brain. So how we can, we use electrodes with multiple channels that we implant in the brain that are, of course, much less compared to the number of neurons that we have in our brain. So, and we use these electrodes to read information in the brain and we want to use this information to control extracorporeal devices, computers, machines, robots, prosthetic hands. But of course... Decoding the signal is challenging in terms of informativeness. So in terms of information that we can extract from this signal, the stability of this signal over time, and also the complexity of the movements or like of the thing that we want to decode and implement in the robotic devices. So in general, the decoding part is the one part where uh, many research groups are putting efforts on, so try to really extract as much as possible information from the brain uh, useful to interact with the environment or to control external devices. On the other side, there is like the other part of the loop. So there is the encoding. So the sensor encoding is um, like newer compared to the decoding. So it's a topic that is now probably since like 10 years, where we are thinking that if you sending back information to the brain, you can write messages into the nervous system, you can communicate with the nervous system, and this is, can improve also your motor skills. Like your, if you have like sensation and you can feel from the prosthetic hand or from extracorporeal limb, you can also control the device better because of your sensory information. This is how our also natural sensory, like sensory motor integration is working. But um, how we can encode this information, how we can send messages that are understandable by the brain, and this is a big challenge, you know, because if you think how many types of sensation you experience when you touch around or you feel like uh, edges and pressure, etc. And all this information are there encoded in a specific way by, by our n- nervous system, our sensory system. So with an artificial simulation, artificial device, we, we want to replicate and replace this system. And this is quite challenging. And maybe the third one that is related to both is how to make this system as more technological. So how to make the system reliable, stable over time, and also how to make this device available and robust enough to tackle all the problems that you can have in everyday life, all the different like scenarios and generalize in the in a more, not only in the lab, but also in everyday life. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I would like to show our listeners the progression of the work that you were doing. And I would like to start with the first project that you have done with the peripheral system. Can you describe briefly what it was and what were the main challenges, findings and outcomes of that project? Yes, thank you. So that the, that project is uh, one of the really translational neuroengineering. So where we, the idea was to help people with amputation. So after the amputation, patients are wearing prosthetic devices that normally are, you physically connect to the stump and to the residual 
part of the leg or on the hands. So we, we did both. But these devices are normally passive so or in general they cannot be really controlled very well and for sure they don't provide any type of sensory feedback to the user so the patient cannot perceive sensation from this prosthetic hand or prosthetic leg but as you can imagine in the moment that you have an, a limb without sensation you don't perceive this limb as part of yourself right you perceive this as more as an external object that is connected to you you can use, maybe can be functional for something, but it's not part of yourself. So the idea was to connect this device uh, with the nervous system in order to like have a volitional control so that you can like actively move this limb and at the same time to send back information, sensor information via the electrical stimulation of peripheral nerves. So the idea was to implant biocompatible and stretchable electrodes in the peripheral nerves. So in case of upper limb abutis, in the arm nerves that are the median and the ulnar nerve that normally innervate the palmar area of the hand. And then in the, what is really fascinating is the fact that if you stimulate these nerves, even after 20, 30 years after amputation, the patient can perceive immediately sensation on the phantom limb. So if you stimulate the median nerve, you will sen- perceive a sensation immediately on the index or on the middle finger, on the thumb, and for the ulnar nerve, on the ring finger or the little finger. So this is like something then you can use for the prosthetic device, because if you have a technology where you have a sensor on the index finger of your prosthetic hand, and every time that you touch with this sensor, you can stimulate the nerve and elicit the sensation, you can perceive finally from and feel sensation from your prosthetic hand. And this is what we did. So together with uh, Professor Michera in the PFL, and then after with Professor Aspopovic in ETH, we developed technologies for upper limb and lower limb amputees able to provide back sensation. So our prosthetic device with sensors that we place on the digits in case of upper limb or with a sensorized insole for lower limb amputees that are like able to record pressure information during like movement and then in real time stimulate the nerves of the patients thanks to this uh, small implant, creating this closed loop uh, so the patient can perceive sensation while he's using the prosthetic device. And this had several benefits. So very like briefly, then we can go more in detail. So we have in general functional benefit. So that means that in the moment that you feel you control better your prosthetic device, uh, and this is also like reasonable if we think to our like if you if you anesthetize your hand or if you for example if you think to be like in a very cold day where you have like very cold hands and you don't feel very well sensation is difficult like to do like some maybe motor task because you don't feel no you use your vision but maybe it's not enough to do to move very well and this is the same thing that they perceived when they use uh, a prosthetic device without sensation so they immediately have an improvement in the motor ability. The second thing that they have also uh, some health benefit, in particular lower limb amputees, we, we observe that in the moment that you have feedback, uh, you are more confident in walking because you feel, so you walk also in a different way because you feel your leg. Uh, and in this way, you consume less energy. This is very important for people that are normally maybe struggling to walk or have very, very heavy and an impact of this loss on the use of prosthesis in daily life, together with the diminishment also of phantom limb pain and pain, because these patients can also suffer from uh, this very uncomfortable syndrome. And this restoration of, sen- of sensory information improves their condition, diminishing pain. And finally, the third big improvement was related to the cognitive benefits. So as we, I mentioned before, if you feel sensation, you feel this limb more as a part of yourself. So you want to wear more the prosthesis and also is more integrated uh, in, your, in your body. Yeah, and definitely leads to the improvement in the quality of life of people. Absolutely. And from what you just told, 
I want to emphasize two moments. And one moment is that very often we don't appreciate the fact of sensory feedback that we are getting, and the sensations. And actually, it's so important. And there is a the huge difference between the prosthesis that doesn't provide this type of sensory feedback and the one that does. So it creates so many benefits when we are providing this type of feedback. That is number one. And number two, about the phantom limbs. We always talk about the treatment for phantom limb syndrome. However, here you are actually using the fact that people have this phantom limb sensation and using it to help people to have sensations from their prosthetic limbs. So that's a very interesting and innovative way to use something that usually is perceived as a hurdle. Yes, it's uh, some post-surgery or post-amputation effect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely indeed. For the first point, so the, the sensory feedback can proceed without, indeed, in all our studies, we always compare the performance of commercially available prosthetic device without sensory feedback and a prosthetic device with sensory feedback. And in general, exactly, these functional benefits, cognitive benefits are always related to the use of a prosthetic without compared to the prosthetic with. We tried both invasive and non-invasive technology, so there is also some effect of using like if you use more invasive technology that are like implanted in the nurse, maybe the benefits are more evident respect to non-invasive, but still with non-invasive also approaches may be more simpler and less invasive indeed. They can also provide some specific benefits for the patient. This is also another big topic of interest of the neuroengineering. For the phantom pain, it's what I have to, to say that we did this study in uh, three uh, per limb amputees implanted, three lower limb amputees implanted for months, and some of them were suffering from phantom pain. This is not a like, huge number of patients or so something that has uh, preliminary results with uh, strong evidence, but the idea is to like, expand the study uh, to a more larger population of patients. But in general, so uh, phantom limb pain, now there are like conferences on only on phantom limb pain because it's a really interesting topic and also something that is not super clear for the community, you know, because there is like some theory saying that is maybe related only to the brain, like to the maladaptive plasticity or something that after amputation can change the organization of the cortex and then Maybe the fact that you don't have any more the streaming sensor information that are going in this part of the brain is creating some invasion of areas that can have like some negative impact. On the other side, there are also like theories on the peripheral nerves that are saying after the you cut the nerve, you have the neuroma pain where there is like this growth of tissue at the end of the nerve. And also in general, the nerve is like a firing uh, and sending like uh, information in, in a aberrant way in a, they call ectopic activity. And uh, indeed, there are like a, a technology where they stimulate very high current and frequency the spinal cord to block this signal for the periphery. But the point is if for some patients are working, for some other patients are not. And then for the central mechanism, there are like the mirror therapy where they put like a, a mirror and they ask the subject to like close an open hand and uh, to have maybe some effect on the cortex. And for half of them, this works. For half of them, no. So there is no like unique maybe solution. But what with our technology, our theory is that that in the moment that you provide the patient with the procedures with feedback, uh, on one side you like stimulate the nerve, regulating more like this activity of the like aberrant activity of the peripheral nerve because you are sending and you stimulate the nerve to follow a certain type of information. And on the other side, you are like sending back to the brain, to that part of the cortex, sensor information that are like congruent, they are like salient. So again, you are kind of restoring or trying to restore the situation 
pre-amputation. So the natural situation where you have like sensory information coming from your hand. And this is can maybe be the reason of the alle- alleviation of pain. Huh? Unfortunately, what we found is that in the moment that we explanted the patient after the clinical trial for ethical reasons, then we had after some months the pain uh, coming back again. So this is a kind of from one like from one end the proof that our intervention was really responsible for this diminishment of pain, but on the other hand, unfortunately, these patients for these patients the pain came back. That is very unfortunate. Hopefully, this will improve as the technology is developing. How long can this implantable device stay in the peripheral system? And also, for how long can it stay implanted in the brain, which already is a topic of your second project? But this is something people ask all the time. Yes. So probably you are also removing the technology, not only because it cannot stay longer, but because the trial ends and that might be one of the reasons. Exactly. You are totally right. So normally when there are regulations defined by the different states and the different countries related to medical technology and the use of implantable medical technology in particular, in Europe, we had the CE and the European uh, Union uh, like Commission uh, related to European projects and the Ministry of Health of every country that is regulating the rules for using novel implantable technology. In the US, there is the FDA that is regulating all the field of uh, brain-computer interface and medical device in general. So in particular, when you develop a new technology that is for human use after maybe a computer simulation, the animal experimentation, so the preclinical steps where you prove that this technology can be effective, you can start to implant the technology with approvals of ethical approval, the standard approval for the use in humans, and then you can go into the patient. You can implant patient, but normally the first trials are pilot trials or trials where you can implant you get the technology for short term period showing that this technology can be effective and there is like a, there are maybe promising results to use this technology with more patients and also for a long, longer period of time this is the reason why i'm saying that the patients that are participating in our study in particular in this study are the pioneers and really people that are fundamental for the development of this technology. Because if you don't have this step, you cannot go and bring your technology to the rest of the world, the rest of patients that maybe need this technology. So they need to participate, be the first patients implanted with this technology. This is what happened with the patients uh, that we recruited in, in, um, in Italy and in Serbia for the two projects on the upper and lower limb amputees uh, patients, uh, where we developed this technology implanted and we implanted them for six months each. So they had two surgery, one for implantation and then after six months, the surgery for the removal where they work with us like every day for these six months and we work together for this technology. Now, there are the evidence that this technology can be beneficial for this type of patients. They are developing a full implantable system for chronic use and then they will implant, I think, in the next year or a couple of years, uh, um, 20 or 30 patients with this technology in different countries uh, to, to like, uh, see the benefit and the long-term evidence. We already like did different analysis of the evolution of stimulation parameters uh, over time of these six months or the status of the electrodes in these six months. And we also published these papers on, on these studies. So you have like uh, this phase. For the brain, uh, or just to say, for the periphery, there are already studies in US with slightly different type of electrodes. Instead of penetrating the nerve, is a cuff electrode, so it's going around the nerve. Where there are patients now implanted seven, eight years, uh, even, t- even 10 years with this technology. So also the peripheral nerves and the, the, the peripheral interfaces are becoming like a chronic uh, For the brain, there are already patients implanted chronically since many years in the brain. 
So the most used and the like approved technology for this type of application uh, intracortically is the Ute electrode, very famous electrode composed by multiple tips and penetrating the cortex around 100 channels that you can use to stimulate the record. And up to now, the, the technology is chronically implanted and you have like connectors, uh, pedestals that you are uh, on the skull where you can connect the cables that are or extract information from the brain or sending simulation to provide feedback. In the implant is in the motor and sensory cortexes. This is the big picture on the two approaches. Yeah, thank you. And maybe you're aware of the longest use of implanted uterine in the user. So what has been the longest so far? In our group, so one patient is implanted here in Chicago, and then there are another two patients in Pittsburgh implanted with the uh, motor and sensory cortices, and uh, Nathan is implanted since nine, ten years, if I remember well. But there are some other patients also implanted with other type of technology, maybe for other purpose, not really for sensory motor restoration, if I remember well, that is implanted, uh, uh, maybe speech decoding. I'm not sure, but uh, there is a recent paper on neurology from BrainGate, uh, that is another big consortium uh, for BCI when they report the safety of using in array and electrode implanted for years, and they report all the patients. I think that there are some patients with uh, around 20 years or 15 years implanted. So this is like, is, is uh, growing like the community of patients implanted with this type of technology. And of course, I mean, if we think about not, not electrode in the cortex, but DBS uh, or, uh, you know, there are also patients with uh, that are using this technology since no cochlear implants that are like chronically used. So it depends. For this specific technology, maybe the time window is a little bit short, but for other neurotechnology implanted in the, in the human body, there are other applications that commonly used in clinical practice, like DBS or cochlear implants. Yeah, thank you so much. And as we already moved into the brain, can you tell our listeners about your current project where you're already using brain implants? And also maybe you can emphasize what skills and what knowledge that you acquired during your first project. Sure, yes. The idea of, of the project that I'm now here in Chicago is again uh, a project where we want to restore the sensory motor loop in patient, in this case, not with an amputation where you have like the rest of the system that you can interface your technology with. So you have nerves, uh, you have the spinal cord, the steel, like everything like above the amputation is fine. In this case, we are, we are considering patient with a lesion like maybe at the neck level or in the spinal cord where Everything below the neck is not functional anymore. You don't have motor or sensory information coming from your body. And the only source where you can extract or, or send information is the, the brain. So it's a more challenging topic. And on, on the other hand, you must use to have like a, a very ineffective and for, for sensory control and to, con, to connect the patient with an external, for example, robotic hands to go into the brain. So implant electrode directly in contact with the cortex, with this area, the, the area of the cortex that is responsible for motor planning and motor execution and the sensory part with the area where you have the hand representation. So in this type of patients, we implant uh, this uterine, this electrodes, multiple electrodes uh, in the motor area of the hand where there, there is the hand representation and the sensory area. In this way, since your, your brain has this somatotopy, so part of the clo like a close part in your brain or close part in your body, and so you have the map, you can exactly place the electrodes where is the hand area. Not, not super easily, but uh, you can do it. And in the moment that you stimulate the brain, the patient, even if like, 
is, uh, there is no communication between the brain and the body, you can elicit sensation that are perceived on the paralyzed hand. And you can also decode information related to the hand movements or to the arm movements. And you can connect this with the virtual reality environment. So you can put like a headset and uh, move a virtual hand or limb in the virtu in virtual reality, much easier like a cursor on the screen or an extracorporeal limb. So you, we have a robotic uh, arm with sensors that we can control. So the patient is seated with, uh, with the implant with the implant and we can record the information to control this extracorporeal limb with sensors. We can record if the patient is touching objects, so we can record from the tactile sensors that we have embedded in the robotic hand. And then we can convert the signal in pattern of electrical stimulation that we inject directly in the sensory cortex. In this way, the patient can perceive the sensation. So the parallelism with the peripheral nerve implant, as, as you can imagine, is the, the goal that is like uh, the same. So in one case, you have you want to communicate through the nurse uh, with the brain. In this case, you want to communicate uh, with the brain uh, directly implanted in the cortex. So this is uh, from the like um, implementation side, from the like uh, purpose of te technological purpose, we can say, we have to find a similar way to encode information using electrical stimulation. So we have an electrode, we have the, the neural tissue, the sensory pathways in a different level, but we want to like send the same type of information that I'm touching with the index finger, a certain type of object, that the surface has this texture, this temperature, in theory, everything you know, related to the object. On the other side, you have the unique opportunity to see and to like uh, see the processing and the differences uh, between like uh, the peripheral nerves interfacing and the direct brain interfacing, and this is, can open like a new like discoveries maybe in the how we encode information, how our touch is encoding in our brain, uh, and what are the the most silent information that we process uh, and the relationship with the motor system. So this is like the the idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And in terms of finding, can you say what are your current most interesting findings from this project? And in terms of, like you said, discovering new things about our nervous system and also improving those patient outcomes, making their life better. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so um, a very recent study. So the, the first thing that I try to do is to, when I, when I arrive in the lab, is to see if uh, something that was like effective and very functional for with the peripheral nerve stimulation can, can be applied also for the brain stimulation. So for example, one thing that I personally uh, propose at the time in the, when when we, we use peripheral nerve stimulation is that, so if you think that when you touch an object, um, so generally just to give you an, uh, like a, a background, in the neuroprosthetic field, uh, you can use electrical stimulation uh, for restoring sensation. And in general, this electrical stimulation can have different types of parameters that you can use. Uh, and of course, in the moment that the first device was developed, uh, this type of uh, modulation of parameters was quite simple. No, because of course, when you start something, you start from the simple like version to see if it's working, and then make it more complex. So the way in which previously the neural simulation was used is to modulate like linearly and very in a, in a quite simple way, these stimulation parameters. But like if you touch an object and you like see inside your nerve, inside your brain, what is this like neural activity connected with your like interaction with the object is very complex. So you have different type of sensory fibers, uh, receptor, mechanoreceptor in your skin uh, and area in your brain that are processing this information, extracting thousands of information related to the object. No, uh, the object 
contact, the, the, the edge, the temperature, the, the texture, everything, no? And everything is encoded uh, through a specific uh, time firing. So spikes in your like uh, nerves uh, and in your brain are have a certain temporal precision, spatial. So there is a spatial temporal activation that is very specific for a certain object. So what we found is that if you use what we call a biometric stimulation, so a stimulation that is trying to resemble this natural activation of the brain, the information that you can send is more natural, so the sensation is more natural, and also is more functional when you use this biometric stimulation in closed loop, so also with your motor decoding, so also with your prosthetic hand. And so when I arrive here, we try to like apply this biometric stimulation also in the brain, showing that when you use this biometric stimulation and also deliver it from multi-channels, so from multiple electrodes at the same time, you can provide a more precise, uh, highly resolution force feedback uh, to the user. So this is one of the very recent results and that came from an evidence also that we had in the peripheral level, something that came from the better understanding of the processing. So it's something that is based on neuroscience. So it's a neuroscience-based approach that at the end was more functional also in terms of practical functionalities. Yeah, absolutely. And what are your next plans? What would be the next steps that you want to complete in this project? There are like uh, many <laughs> things that are on the table now because, of course, uh, as I said, there are like uh, with, with this technology, more you are working with this and also with, with Scott, with the patient, more you are understanding, better you're understanding, more opportunities, the technology is improving. So you can really do many different things. Uh, we are working on, of course, creating something very functional in terms of closed loop. So we, uh, so one challenge also that we have when we, in the brain in respect to the periphery is that, that you, when you stimulate in, your, in the brain, since the areas are quite close, you can have some interaction of your stimulation uh, from the sensory on your motor. And so this is like uh, creating uh, difficulties then in decoding and creating this closed loop. So what we are trying now is to uh, develop a system that is robust for the closed loop use and also to test more functionally this like uh, brain-computer interface to see and to test it to improve this technology for the real-life scenarios and really interacting with objects with the external world. This is like more the translational goal, not more like uh, bring this technology to the outside of the lab. In parallel, what is unique about, for example, our patient here, Scott, is that he can also feel sensation because he's a partially spinal cord injury patient. So he has a, a residual natural touch from his body. So what we can do is to like try to understand better how this natural system, since we have the unique opportunity to have the implant in the sensory cortex of this subject, to see how the natural system is encoding information eh? and then use this information to inform the design of our artificial stimulation to like uh, be able to encode in the future all the multifaceted touch experience uh, that we have normally when we touch object. Thank you so much. And Of course, if you are like in studying this thing, you are into the, the project, you work many hours on the project, and sometimes you realize that after that there is something that you can change. Of course, it was like super easy to, to understand then a posteriori, but maybe a priori, no? So for example, one thing is that when we pass from the, from the upper to the lower limb, so we started with the upper limb and we developed all the technology for upper limb. We collected evidence and then we started. We were the first in Europe to do this type of, first in the world to do like intraneural for lower limb amputees and first in Europe for peripheral nerve stimulation in, uh, in patients with leg amputation. So when we designed this technology, we realized that this was not the case for upper limb amputee, that the patient with lower limb amputees, even if they, are, they have the prosthesis without feedback, uh, 
they have a residual feedback from the interaction of the of the stamp with the with the socket of the prosthesis. No, so if a, you are like a step over a stone or something in the ground, you can perceive that there is something under your foot. No, and this is not the case if you have like a prosthetic hand and you touch something, you cannot have any type of residual informative residual information. But for the lower limb, yes. And so the first time that we realized this, this is so like trivial, maybe, you know, in the moment that you approach the problem and then we realized that. And so we provide the feedback that was maybe more useful to understand where this interaction was, uh, how intense, uh, what type of information. And then also speaking with the patients, in particular, we develop and now we are going in the direction to have a company and that also some simply or non-invasive device uh, that can have lower limb amputees uh, using uh, non-invasive technology that you can wear easily without surgery. It, it's a simple, but still, it is like surprising how many information you can extract and how the brain is uh, plastic to like be trained with something uh, and then use this to uh, have work better, for example. Yeah, thank you so much. And now I would like to ask you about your company, My Leg. Can you tell our listeners about it and what what is the goal of the company and what are you doing? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so exactly, when when we developed this invasive technology, we had also some conversation with patients and also with procedure manufacturers. Uh, one idea was, okay, we have maybe the invasive technology that can be very cool, very also at the uh, neuroscientific level. But if we want to help now the patient very fast, maybe with some simple thing, uh, or maybe if the patient doesn't want really to have a second surgery, but prefer to have like something that can be easily added to their prosthetic device, we can develop maybe some non-invasive feedback. So together working with patients, again, with this user-centered approach, so like asking to patients, work with them, get feedback on the development, we developed this technology. We want to provide sensory feedback to patients with lower limb amputation. And we use a belt of electrodes that we place around the stamp of the patient. So it's completely non-invasive. We have a textile electrodes, washable. This belt has electrodes inside. And these electrodes are stimulating with a short and bursts of current. So you perceive this like a vibration, okay, in different parts of the stamp. So we have electrodes in the front, in the lateral side, and in the back. And these electrodes are connected with a sensor ID insole that we place under the prosthetic foot. So every time that the patient touch the ground with the heel, they sense the electrodes in the back of the stamp start to vibrate. If you go on the lateral, the lateral part of your stamp. If you go on the frontal side of your foot, the frontal side of your stamp. So there is a kind of map of the stamp in the sensor ID insole. In this way, the patient can have a very simple information about the interaction of the prosthetic foot and the leg with the ground. And this is already useful to have more confidence in your prosthetic device because you don't have to look at your like device every time or, for example, in the dark or if you are carrying something and you cannot see your foot, if the foot is in contact or not with the ground, if there is a stair or something. So with this very simple device, we participated at Cybertron. That is this competition uh, kind of uh, like uh, Olympic Games, but for people with uh, disability, that they can use every type of technology that they want, super sophisticated, super simple, but not in very, in like uh, daily life tasks. So they have to accomplish like uh, climb the stairs, uh, walk on uneven terrains, or like grasp an object. There are different categories. We won the silver medal in 2020 and 2021 between uh, big companies. Uh, we were like a very small research group at the time. So we, we were super, super excited about, uh, about the results. And then we started to test the device, improve the device. And now the, we, we, the idea is that we are trying to bring this device. Uh, we, do, we, we had some support from, from Swiss agencies. And then we are trying to bring this technology to the to the market. 
to have like it maybe cheap and uh, easy to wear a non-invasive sensory feedback device. That's beautiful. So can you tell about your plans when people might start seeing possibly this type of device on the market and use it? Sure, sure, yes. So now we'll start the clinical trial uh, for the certification of the device very soon, this year probably. So we'll play also post and some recruitment, some the link for the recruitment of the patients. And then after the certification, Probably we will start to sell the device uh, next year or in a couple of years maximum so that we can then bring this technology to patients and in the clinics first and then also to directly to patients. Of course, now there is like the plan for certification also also in US because uh, US is the big market. So there are big numbers of amputees and we are also developing a system with a similar idea uh, with uh, for patients with uh, diabetes and with neuropathy because they are suffering similar problems. So they have a foot or a leg with uh, desensitized or with uh, like low sensations. And so we can stimulate and provide some feedback in order to improve their walking. So the, there is Greta Pratoni that now I, uh, she's the CEO of the company that is like bringing this technology further. That's beautiful. I wish you and your company all possible success and to get those devices as fast as possible to people. So that that's wonderful that you're doing all this amazing work. Thank you. And how do you see the field of neuroengineering, specifically in your field, maybe 20, 50, and maybe even 100 years from now? Uh, this is a very like difficult question, but of course, as I said, the, the, the field is growing. Also, the, the neurotech market is growing. So the interest of both general population and VC and research is going all in the same direction. So we will see for sure technologies that can improve the quality of life of patients for neurological disorders. There is another big field that is the electroceutical or like the bioelectronic medicine. So the fight to the, the, the thing to like uh, replace drugs with implantable devices and uh, stimulating the nerves, the organs. Uh, in general, this is like we can think about vagus nerve stimulation, or you know, there are many groups and companies now that are trying to target not the somatic nervous system but the autonomic nervous system to regulate the organ functions uh, for uh, like diseases that are affecting a big population of patients. So for sure, this like a revolution in medicine with uh, for the drugs, passing from drugs in something more like implantable, small chips uh, or like transimplanted for stimulation will, uh, will arrive. And now there are like uh, projects going to the direction also for human augmentation. So use the neurotechnology to not only improve the quality of life of patients with neurological disease, but try to connect uh, the healthy nervous system with our devices uh, in real life. This is like a need, of course, uh, the help of neuroethics uh, and everything related to the effect on using this technology with people that they don't need really surgeries or like, no, but maybe something non-invasive at the beginning and then after something invasive, who knows? But uh, for sure, also in that in that direction, there are people saying that we should look at the like science fiction and all the books because now you know they started like that and then they become reality after. So we can think about I don't know Doctor Octopus or who knows. <laughs> Yes, yes. It's so interesting how the things that were science fiction some time ago are now a reality. So that that's beautiful. So we need to give our fantasy imagination more space and we will have more amazing things available for people. What do you think became possible in terms of knowledge about our brain that wasn't possible without this uh, innovative uh, neuroengineering? engineering approaches that we're using right now? Yeah, so for me as a scientist, it's the most fascinating opportunity. So the fact that uh, this type of technology now is a unique window on the nervous system that is new, it can open like uh, new discoveries and uh, 
research in the basic science and, and, and processing of our brain because in the moment that we have electrodes or technology directly implanted in the brain, interacting with the brain, also maybe for years, uh, and you can, you, we can really study the brain uh, in a way that is completely new respect to before, no? because even with like all the studies in, in animals so now are becoming like a more unveiling some important processing that maybe was not possible with the technology of uh, like 50 or 20 years ago, but now is becoming possible. But with this new type of technology, we can achieve results uh, in terms of efficacy, but also in terms of unveiling all the mystery in all of the, the brain and the processing that is still impossible to replicate uh, or like, you know, to, to simulate. And, but this is, uh, this is possible. I see, for example, optogenetics as a way for simulation interacting with the brain, a very interesting technique that uses lights activating like uh, individual neurons of specific types compared to the electrical stimulation. So maybe we will change uh, completely the way in which we interact. No? Of course, the technology is also driven, the type of uh, results. Uh, the neuroscientific part is going like uh, in parallel and together with the technology development. Thank you. And can you maybe mention one thing that you thought of as impossible that you actually made possible? <laughs> Tough question. So for sure, the first time that you see a person paralyzed that is controlling with this thought and like with this like volitionally control an external robot, you know, robotic hand completely detached and this hand is grasping object it is able to like uh, manipulate this object and understand it is touching with this object. Uh, this is like, if you don't see, probably you don't believe immediate or like you have to think about it. And for sure, another really like uh, emotional moment is the moment where for with the amputees, the first time that oh, I we stimulate Almerina one housewife that lost her hand during an industry work. And uh, after 23 years, we stimulate with, uh, after the surgery, there is one week of recovery. Then she came to the lab. Uh, we are like together. I stimulate and she was like, this is my hand. Like after 30 years and she was like crying, like, uh, you know, very, very emotional moment. And uh, yeah, this is the reason why I really like work with, um, with patients, like with people. Yeah. So this is like uh, something that was really impressive. Yeah. And how, in your opinion, to make impossible possible? So some things that we don't believe that are possible, how to actually make them possible eventually? Yes, for those who are thinking about doing something that is not possible yet. Yeah, for sure. I think that the first thing is to make this happen is the, the fact to be open to ideas also from different like uh, field of research, because this can contaminate you in a, like in a so positive way and open like a new, completely new like field of research or vision on a single problem because maybe we are like a focus for years and years to try this type of approach to achieve a certain goal but then maybe from another field or another like background they can see the problem for a completely different perspective and then if you start to like uh, in that direction maybe you can achieve something completely new so for me, sharing the ideas uh, as a multidisciplinary group uh, open to new ideas that are coming from, you know, also students or like, you know, this is, can be really, and don't be stick too much to your ideas. Uh, this is, I think, are the, the, the ingredients uh, can really change uh, the quality of research or the outcome. Because if you like, uh, sometimes uh, you can proceed in one direction, it's good to have perseverance. I mean, you continue. But maybe you, it's more valuable to stop, uh, do a step back, uh, change your idea, your mindset, and approach from another, another direction. And this is super difficult. 
Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, but I think more and more people need to do it because now, especially this type of work is really conducted in very multidisciplinary field. So, you know, sometimes with a push, but it's important to expose yourself to those different fields and then definitely uh, there will be a better outcome. Can you share any advice for those who are interested in pursuing a career in your engineering and what they should do to prepare themselves for this field? Yeah, so I think it's now it's a good moment. So I think what I can say is that it's a career that has a, an impact, a possibility to work, possibility to travel, to be successful, to work in company research. So I think it's a field that is uh, growing and is uh, bringing very nice opportunities and results in the future. So the advice that I can give is in general that I know that maybe if you're a student, you are like uh, interested to, to many different research in the field of bioengineering and neuroengineering. So the first difficult part is to, during the university, you should like try different projects in different like field, also to understand, okay, this is I like more and this is less. So you like restrict the possibilities and then to focus on things that you are really passionate for. Because this work requires dedication, the results uh, are like uh, maybe you don't have results for a long period of time, and then you arrive at a big discovery. So you need to be patient and passionate, continuing to work, and maybe also with some negative results. Of course, with some negative results, not, for, not maybe for sure, with some negative results and then arrive at what you want. And the second thing is to ready to be to, to travel, spend some time in a different environments, try to be like a sponge, you know, try to like absorb information uh, from different groups, uh, from different type of researches, and uh, as I said, also from different uh, backgrounds. This can be very valuable then when you work in team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And can you briefly discuss any upcoming events, conferences, or other opportunities for those interested in neuroengineering to connect with others in the field and stay up to date with the latest developments? Sure, yes. In general, for who is passionate for neuroscience, neuroprocedure, neuroengineering, there are conferences. One of the most important, I think, even if it's very big, that maybe sometimes can be uh, not the positive point, but is a SFN, that is the Society for Neuroscience, uh, organize an annual uh, meeting uh, in uh, or here in Chicago or in Washington or in San Diego every year. The first time that I, that I went there as a student, I was absolutely impressed by the quality of the research, uh, the fantastic scientists. Last year, there were like uh, two or three Nobel Prizes uh, so it's a very unique opportunity. And of course, there are more specific conferences uh, with, uh, depending by, by the topics uh, that, uh, that you need. But of course, if you want more information, more specific information, they can contact me on, on LinkedIn or with other questions. Of course, I'm always available because I part of it. So in the future, I want to have my team uh, be a professor in this field. So part of the teaching. And I really like this part of the job. Oh, thank you so much. Maybe you have recommendations for some specific events in neuroengineering, maybe some specific books, textbooks that our listeners can read, or maybe even some courses that are available broadly online, at least to get an understanding of this field and to get the fit into this area. Yes. Yeah. Regarding uh, events, uh, as I said, the SFN is a very like uh, important event for us. There is also the BCI Society meeting in June. Uh, there is a neuroengineering conference called uh, NER every year for NBC is another conference. So there are other conferences, but are uh, are more for maybe researchers, uh, for example, PhD, postdoc, or you know. For students, that are there, I, I suggest when I was a student and I'm still doing this, uh, there are TED Talks of different TED Talks with professors, very famous uh, now in neuroengineering, uh, that they are showing uh, very fascinating technologies of integration, uh, neuroprosthetic for locomotion, uh, neuroprosthetic for speech. Uh, 
Um, this can give you a very short idea of the big picture of the project and um, very inspiring projects. Um, and then there are courses uh, on, on Coursera or, or like more specifically that, that one can do like also online from professors that are famous in the field. Yeah. Thank you. And you mentioned that our listeners can contact you through LinkedIn. What websites or what information would you recommend for them to learn more about your work? And if there is any other way where they can learn about you and contact you? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So they want to know more about the project on BCI, there is my Lab website, or recently there is also a Twitter account on cortical bionics that is the research group uh, with Pittsburgh Northwestern University and uh, University of Chicago for the BCI program where they can be like really updated with uh, with all the papers and uh, uh, recent developments um, on my LinkedIn page I have also a Twitter account uh, Giacomo Valle Giacomo underscore Valle they can Contact me both for information related to the maybe project available for master students, semester students, or maybe also internship for a startup or who is more interested in the in the startup field. Let's say that interest in startup field. What skills, what knowledge would you expect for students to have to join you? Yeah. So uh, for the startup fields, um, personally, after engineering uh, and my PhD, I did an, an MBA. I mean, if you approach the field of, of startups and you want to have your startup, uh, you must uh, know some basic on business also. No? Of course, if you are recruited for internship or some other like position in the startup, uh, no. But if you want to have your startup, what I suggest is to have also a background or study a bit of business because you cannot be only the guy that is developing the technology and then you don't have an idea about uh, the, you know, how to bring this technology to the market or to give a certain value. You don't know anything about value or about your technology. So the startup field is something that is very difficult, um, but also very pleasant to, to do if you are with the, with the, with the right group. This is why, and uh, we are lucky that we have um, a very passionate group uh, that are working hard in this project. The, 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 the scope and the aim of the company is, in my opinion, uh, very, very valuable for the society and for the society. So we are searching now for people that are um, maybe have uh, some background in the quality and in the regulatory for the phase of uh, regulation and uh, certification. We are also searching for uh, people with a complementary background, uh, so with the business, uh, business model, business development, but also engineers uh, for the, the final design of the technology. Thank you so much. I hope maybe somebody who is listening to us will contact you and maybe even join your team. Is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners before we wrap up our podcast today? I think I, I cover all the like topics and uh, also I give enough advice for everyone. Okay. No, thank you so much, Giacomo. It was a great pleasure. I learned so much from you today, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate everything you told us today. So thank you, and I wish you all possible success in all your studies and your startup and creating a future of what's possible in this amazing field. So thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much.